I'm Ari Lynette, and today I'll be trying my best to talk about my favorite film of 2019. If you've seen the title of this episode, yes, we're really talking about cats today. <laughs> Don't get all naive, you knew what you were getting into. Don't act like you're not totally hyped to hear me talk about cat boobs for the next 20 minutes, or however long this podcast lasts, I'm not sure. But don't get me wrong, this is a bad movie. <laughs> this is a horrendous movie. But for me at least, it's a horrendously glorious experience, and I have not been able to shut up about it for the past few months since I've seen it. I'm pretty sure I saw it in December when it came out, and I've seen it twice now. Like, if any of my friends bring up anything movie-adjacent or musical-adjacent, there's a chance I'm going to pivot the conversation towards Jason Derulo's CGI bulge. That's just the way it is. And I want to explain why. I want to get into all of the nitty-gritty about going to see this film, how hilariously uncanny some of the moments are, the fact that the songs continue to be stuck in my head, and why I'm still not done talking about this film. It's a whole evaluation, so I hope you're ready for it. I feel like this is an evaluation that needs to be done, otherwise you'll just be questioning my logic throughout this whole podcast, like some unreliable narrator that can't be trusted with media. But no, I promise there's a reason I like this film. You'll get there. But before I get onto the glorious disaster piece that is Tom Hooper's Cats, today is a very exciting day for me as I'm recording my first ever full episode of this podcast today. I have to say I'm very excited to be doing this, albeit rather nervous. Honestly, I had a few ideas for the first episode of this podcast, but what better way to start off this podcast to roll out the red carpet for my entry into this new medium than cats? I had other ideas, but nothing was going to compete, you know? And if by chance you think this episode is incredibly weird, I can assure you that not all of them are going to be like this, but some of them are. And it just happens I'm dropping one of those first. So, this is episode one. You're welcome. So, before I get onto my analysis slash review slash salivating over this train wreck of a movie, I want to give three different origin stories. One for the film, one for the musical that the film was based on, and one for the poetry book that the musical that the film was based on was based on. I know it's confusing, but you're, you're essentially getting like three different origin stories already, and we're not even past the first episode, so I feel like I'm treating you into quite a lot of exposition, so... Uh, bear with me here. So first of all, let's talk about the film. Cats is a 2019 feature-length film directed by Tom Hooper. His filmography includes titles such as The Damned United, The King's Speech, The Danish Girl, and, more recently, the film adaptation of Les Miserables. He's been nominated for a bunch of awards. He won the Academy Award for Best Director for The King's Speech. In comparison, he's more recently won the award for Worst Director in the last Golden Raspberry Awards. The Cats. Yeah, this is the cinematic definition of a rough patch on a pretty well-maintained record, but I haven't seen any of his other films, so I can only really judge on this one. And boy, is it a cocker to judge on. So, it goes without saying that this film isn't necessarily an original property, unless you happen to be living under a rock. Cats the Movie is based on Cats the Musical, which was composed by Andrew Lloyd Webber. You're probably aware that he's composed quite a lot of arguably iconic musicals, such as Phantom of the Opera, Evita, and Jesus Christ Superstar. The fact that I had a lot of choice choosing which three examples to list in this podcast is a sign this guy has done a lot of very famous musicals. And also Love Never Dies. <laughs> wow, I really shouldn't throw stones like I've done anything as significant as this man's work, but in my defense, his Wikipedia page does say that he's a longtime supporter of the Conservative Party, and if I'm presented with the opportunity to bash a Tory, well, by gum I'm gonna do it. If you don't like people bashing the Tories, I'm afraid this podcast might be a bit of a slog for you. But despite all of that, he has created some incredible work. That's pretty undeniable. And one of those works was Cats the Musical. But Cats the Musical wasn't even an original property in itself. Much of the songwriting and the story, let's use quotation marks for that word, was adapted from a book called Old Possum's Book of Practical Cats by T.S. Eliot. It's a book of poems, just to add. And something interesting about T.S. Eliot is that this is a guy who has an even more um, concerning political viewpoint, as shown by his demonstrations of anti-Semitism and misogyny within his work. I won't get into it too much. Maggie Mayfish did a great video on that. But from what I can tell, many of these, let's call them insensitivities, haven't carried through into the movie. I'm not sure if they're carried through into the musical. I've, I've never actually seen it. I know, I know. Fake fan over here. 
But I've heard things about songs in the musical being edited and even excised altogether for racial insensitivities, and the film songs have also had some changes from what I've seen through research and other people's reviews. It, it's a nuanced subject. I'd like to make an episode one day about this whole phenomenon of looking at old media with perhaps antiquated viewpoints and how we can approach them in a modern context, but that's not what I'm going to do here. Today we're doing cats, so let's let's focus on cats. So, Universal Pictures decided to make a movie based on a musical, based on a book of poems about cats. And not just any cats, but jellical cats. If you don't know what a jellical cat is, you'll probably go to your grave not knowing that, unless you just assume that it means whatever human-cat antichrist hybrid species populates this film. So let's go with that assumption, and let's touch on the plot of the film. I say plot in the same way I said story earlier on, in quotation marks. Because there is a heavy debate to whether this film, or the original musical, even has a plot. Mostly the consensus it's no, it's more of a review, but they try their best to convince the audience that there's a plot, they add some extra threads in the film, but the basic conceit of the musical and the movie is this. A group of cats called the Jellical Cats take turns to sing songs and essentially compete to die. Yeah, these cats want to be reborn into another life. They want to go to the Heaviside Lair, which is presumably an afterlife of sorts. And the leader of the Jellicles, Old Deuteronomy, gets to make this choice. And this is called, creatively, the Jellicle Choice. So that kind of is the plot. And the sooner you accept that, the sooner you'll be at peace with it. So just don't question it. So now, let's meet the cast of this film. This film is really, truly led by the dancers. But only one gets to be credited on the poster, <laughs> bless. And that's Francesca Hayward, who plays Victoria the White Cat. She's our lead and the audience surrogate of the film. The rest of the poster's billing focuses on the celebrities that are involved in this film. We have James Corden, Rebel Wilson, Sir Ian McKellen, Dame Judi Dench, Idris Elba, Jennifer Hudson, Taylor Swift, and Jason Derulo. Just reading that list off my note sheets right now is just baffling because it's such a weird combination of talents, but... It turns out exactly as you expect, because this is a weird fucking movie. Some other stats about this movie is that its editing was finished just hours before its premiere. It had to have essentially a patch update to fix some of the busted visual effects a couple of days after release, which is pretty much unheard of in like cinema releases. It did receive a Golden Globe nomination for Best Original Song, and strangely enough, it also received a Nickelodeon Kids' Choice Award nomination, which is... that's the goal, really as well as nine nominations in my favourite award ceremony, The Golden Raspberries, which honours the worst films of the year. I love following them. It's a lot of fun. Sometimes more fun than the Oscars. It won six of those awards, and they even had two entries in two of those categories, so really they only lost one of those awards, and that was for Worst Actress for Francesca Hayward. And I disagree with her even being nominated for that award, but that's a whole diatribe, I'll explain that later. What it did not receive was a single Oscar nod because Universal withdrew the film from the studios for your consideration lists in shame. Honestly, that's a coward move. I would have left it in. I would have left the film in for your consideration just in case the Academy was actually like, you know what, let's give it something. I think that this deserves this nod and it's nominated for like even one of the creative arts nods. I felt like that would have been interesting and I kind of sad they took it out. And my last fact is about the cost of this film. This film had a budget of somewhere in the region of 80 to 100 million dollars. And that's not counting the marketing costs of around 115 million dollars. And the film only made 75.5 million back. Yikes. So this movie bombed. And in my humble opinion, the best kinds of box office bombs are the ones that bomb spectacularly. Like, big cast, big budget big expectations, then big failure. It's so sad, but it's also just so funny. One thing I'm not going to do is just spend this whole episode bashing the film, because there are a lot of talented people that worked on it, that probably took a lot of time and investment to work on it, and ultimately I enjoyed the whole experience of this film. It's a fun movie, and there's a lot of ironic value in it, but there's also some things I unironically appreciate about it. Speaking of which, let's talk about those really cool things that I appreciate about this film. First of all, I appreciate the visual effects artists for having to suffer through animating and texturing whatever these abominations were. I, I just have to say this because I've just finished studying a university course in computer character animation, and 
I feel like I need to lay out for some people the way that big budget films work because people have been bashing these artists left, right and centre and I don't like it. People have been blaming the visual effects team for how this movie looks, giving them shit about it, when in reality they were only really in charge of getting the thing to exist in CGI. They weren't responsible for deciding what they looked like, how realistic they'd be, how each design would work. They're just being told what to do by the people above. These designs were probably run by all of these different people. The director, by the producers, by boards of people who were not these visual effects artists. These are the last people who would be allowed to step in and be like, um, hey, these designs kind of look like they belong in the fiery pits of hell. Because, you know, a studio exec would just clap back, like, this is the way we're doing the film, this is what the director wants, this is his vision, just do it. And they probably had a lot of pressure on their hands. They didn't use mocap suits, you know, motion capture suits, so all of the fur application, the, the digital fur technology, as they call it, that had to be applied manually, and that takes longer. And I've had some things about them struggling with the VFX budget, especially later on in production. Like, there's a lot more under the surface than just visual effects bad. So seeing James Corden and Rebel Wilson essentially throw them under the bus at an award show is pretty despicable, if I'm honest. These people are overworked, probably underpaid, definitely undervalued, and underappreciated by the people overseeing this project. Say what you want about the creepy movements, the unsettling ears, the boobs, the bulges, whatever. Just give these people a break. It's not their fault. I'd also like to talk a little bit about the set design. I think it is really cool that they filmed this on practical sets. I love seeing the behind the scenes stuff and seeing practical sets involved. Even though my degree is in the field of computer animation, I think there's just something so underappreciated and charming about practical effects. And I think that people are getting more wind of this, but I definitely like to see more studios in that mindset. Like if there's too much CGI in a scene, it's gonna overwhelm you and nothing's really gonna feel real or significant. For me, too much CGI is just nauseating. It just makes everything look flat and cheap. My big example is the Star Wars prequels, where I feel like the golden rule in production must have just been, like, throw CGI at it, and it's just aged horribly. So then when you look at the sequel trilogy, there's more of a use of practical effects, map painting, all blended with the CGI. And it works a lot better. Obviously, like, technology's moved up since then, but it feels more tactile, like a reality that's taking place in front of you that you can touch. And I think the biggest example of this, you cannot tell me that people would be as excited about Baby Yoda if it was CGI. It wouldn't work, because the use of puppetry and animatronics is so charming and it feels real, especially with the technology nowadays. There's only a little bit of CGI used with the child, and that's one of the big reasons why it became such a phenomenon. Why it's this beloved Baby Yoda. Like, ba baby Yoda is because of practical work, because practical work is charming and it can really make a production pop. And I think that's true with the sets and cats. There's this oddly scaled whimsy to the whole thing. And also, if I think the, the sets were also computer generated with the digital fair technology and all of that on top of it, it would just be so much CGI and so bombastically overwhelming and you just fall into that prequels trap. So I'm very happy that the sets were practical. <laughs> now, one thing I can say about this musical is that the songs slap. <laughs> I've never seen the musical before, so perhaps that's mainly a quality of the musical rather than the film, but either way, they're great. I had a lot of fun. I don't want to talk about them too much because otherwise I'll get them stuck in my head for the 50th time, but there's some really catchy stuff in here. It's all a bit weird and nonsensical, and some of the diction could be refined, but you are immersed with the amount of music that gets thrown at you, and surprisingly, a lot of it sticks. Jellicle Songs for Jellicle Cats, The Rum Tum Tugger, Mr. Mistopheles, they all slap. There is no limit to the amount of times I've struggled with my stuff to Taylor Swift's version of McCavity while acting like I'm going to be the next member of the Pussycat Dolls. Even stuff like the old Gumby Cat, it's so easy for me to get that song stuck in my head, even if it's just one line. It's kind of concerning. There is a new song in this film, which was co-written by Taylor Swift and Andrew Lloyd Webber, and probably done to qualify for that Best Original Song Award that never happened. And Beautiful Ghost is a nice song, but it's definitely different from the rest of the songs because it has comprehensible lyrics that aren't in gibberish, which only memory really is the exception to the gibberish lyrics rule in this film and the musical. A beautiful ghost feels like it's consciously trying to one-up memory, <laughs> like, yeah, you're going through this trauma, but at least you have memories, I have nothing, and I'm alone, and it's like, feline whataboutism. <laughs> but it's still a nice song, and the vocals are decent. And last but never least, let's talk about memory. Jennifer Hudson's version of this song is going to be criminally underrated because of this movie. She performs this song like she is living this song. 
she's acting through the song and playing all of those emotions like that bubbling to the surface she kills it you can hit every other thing about this movie if you want to and disagree with every positive critique i give but gosh darn it i will not let you hit this performance it's mesmerizing and finally this is going to be a longer section but we're going to talk about the acting now a lot of the acting performances in this film, as far as the big celebrity talent is concerned, it's just that celebrity going through their usual motions, and they do it successfully. Judy Dench does a good job, Ian McKellen does a good job, Idris Elba does a good job, I didn't hate James Corden in this film, which is a rare and pleasant surprise. I don't have a great deal else to say about those performances, but I'm going to bring up a few other specific performances and briefly touch on them. So probably my favourite performance was Jennifer Hudson as Grisabella because she just acted through this movie. She's the one character you kind of have to take seriously because of her circumstance. And she does that. She does a serious performance with genuine emotion. And I'm surprised that more people aren't talking about that. She acts through her expressions, through the songs, through all the shit that gets thrown at her. And by that, I mean both what Grisabella goes through in this film and what Jennifer Hudson had to go through in the production, by that I mean the awkward visual effects, again, not their fault, and the amount of snot on her lip, which from what I've heard about Tom Hooper's Les Miserables, he likes his actors to go through it with sweat and tears and snot. So honestly, I salute Jay Hood's performance in this film because she did that despite all that. And I have to say also, Jason Derulo was great in this movie. And I was baffled as anyone when his casting was announced, but honestly, he did an awesome job as Rum Tum Tugger. He did this strange Cockney accent as part of his dialogue, and I wasn't sure if that landed the best. But his presence and performance during his song, it was pretty rad. He had all the charisma, and the vocals were great. The diction and the pronunciation could have been better. But overall, the vibe worked out well. And I love that even after all of this, it's good old Jason Derulo who's the one going to bat for this movie. He thought it would change the world. Well, it changed mine, surely. So let's touch on the other famous singer in this cast, and the one that's usually in the thumbnails of any YouTube video about this movie. Yep, we're talking about Taylor Swift. She did a really great job. However, I hesitate to say too much about her performance, considering she was only in the film for like six minutes tops. The marketing for this film was misleading as hell if you are coming into this cinema thinking she'd be a main character, because she isn't even in the main ensemble. She appears for one song, the Macavity number, then she appears very briefly on the boat afterwards, and then you never see her again. But for the time she is there, you get the feeling that she kind of understands the vibe of what the film should be, rather than the way that it was intended by the director and marketed by the studio. Like, I'm not even a big Swifty, but I think her performance was so much fun. It was campy, it had pizzazz, and it really livened up the story. So for the little screen time you had in this film, I can safely say that Taylor Swift... You were one of the best people in this movie. And the last performance I'm going to talk about, and the one where I'm going to go heavy on the defense, is Francesca Hayward as Victoria. She got nominated for the Worst Actress Award at the Golden Raspberries, and honestly, I disagree with it. A lot of people were saying, like, oh, she only has one facial expression about the movie. She always looks bewildered. And, like, first of all, no, I don't see it. I saw plenty of other expressions in this movie. And second of all, if she were just constantly bewildered throughout the whole runtime of this film, could you really blame her? Her character has been dropped in a situation where she's surrounded by these cats calling themselves the Jellicles, whatever they are. She doesn't know. She doesn't know that. They move weirdly. They dance weirdly. They're singing these songs with barely comprehensible lyrics that no one can understand except for some guy that died over 50 years ago, and that's not a reason to be bewildered. If I were Victoria, I'd be confused as fuck. I'd be seriously questioning my existence, and I'd be fully dissociating. On the outside, chances are I'd probably stay in that face for the whole 110 minutes of runtime. And also, this is her first acting performance. She's not a trained actress. She's a trained dancer. And chances are she was probably pretty nervous about it. And she's not the best actress, not in this film or in general, but she's not exceptionally bad either. I just feel like people were too harsh on her and lumped in a decent performance as part of all of the horrifically bad things about this film, which, yes, there are horrific elements of this film, but this is not one of them. As far as I'm concerned, she gave a competent acting performance in a film that isn't really about acting performance, but more about performing performance. In this film, the character of Victoria is the audience surrogate. She's meant to represent an outsider's perspective of this whole charade. She's meant to represent us. Her being a blank slate kind of is the point of the character. And if that's questionable and you think it doesn't work in the story, that's fine. But that's not an acting problem. That's a writing problem. 
It's not her fault. So, my overall statement for this section of the episode is justice for Francesca Hayward and the whole VFX team. Put that on the poster. Now we're going to go on to the section y'all were actually waiting for. This is the section of the episode where I'm going to talk about my favourite chaotic moments from this film. And let me just lay out my definition of chaotic so you know exactly where I'm coming from. Chaotic refers to a moment which is not good, but also so bizarre and mesmerising that I couldn't possibly call it bad. So we're just going to call it chaotic. (laughs) And that's a lot of the film. (laughs) And we're going to start from the very beginning, and I mean the very beginning of Cats. The intro of this film sets the tone for the entire thing. It is one of the most chaotic moments in this entire film, yet it also happens to be a warning shot for what you're about to go into. So let's lay down the scene of the intro, shall we? The intro begins with a cat's face in the sky, which pans down to a street in London, question mark? I think it's London. Then we see a car pulling up. That car has a human in it. We do not see the human's face, but we see that it is clearly a human. That's something that does not get explained. (laughs) If you're confused by the logic of humans and cats in this world and how they look and whatnot, get comfortable because you're going to be there until you also reach the side layer. So, human gets out of the car and drops a bag on the street. There's a cat in the bag. The cat isn't sure why they're in the bag and they spend some time riding around to try and get out of the bag. While all of this is happening, the other cats are creeping onto the scene, crawling around in this weird rhythmic fashion. It's like kind of dancey, but it's also like a cult. It, it's like a cult. They're like dancing in the circle around her, and the camera keeps making cuts from the bag to the cats to the bag to the cats, and the music picks up. And it's just so intense and weird. I wasn't sure whether it was funny or disturbing or a little bit of both. It's just such a heavy introduction to this film, and it hits you like a repeated news favor to the face. So all of this is still going on. The bag's still writhing about. The cats are going ham on this, dancing or whatever. Can you call it choreography? I don't know. Movementography. The, the camera's jumping about. The score is so heavy, you need a chainsaw to cut it. And everything just builds and builds and builds to the bag opening. And who comes out but Victoria, the white cat. She stands there. She looks confused. And in that moment, I have to say, girls, same. And then it goes into Jellicle Songs for Jellicle Cats, which is only slightly less weird. The chorus is catchy, and it kind of puts you at ease after the sheer whiplash of the intro. It makes you wonder if maybe that was it. Maybe the rest of the movie's going to be normal. And then you get to the Gumby Cat number, and you're like, oh no, it's happening again. And this time it's Rebel Wilson. And I actually like Rebel Wilson. Maybe that's just my pitch-perfect nostalgia coming out. But I didn't hate her performance like some people did. I just want to say, whoever wrote this movie, they gave Rebel Wilson some weird shit to do. I think she got the most embarrassing stuff to do. Like, a good five seconds of her introduction is just a shot of her scratching a crotch. It, 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 there are multiple angles as well. It is painfully awkward. But also, you laugh. Because if you didn't laugh, you'd probably cry. Or just die inside. But she's not even the main cause of chaos in this scene. I just burped. I'm sorry. I just had some snacks. So let me just line out what the main source of chaos is in the scene, because this, the title of this film is misleading. It's not just cats. In this movie, you are not just getting a bunch of cats. You're getting a bunch of mice. Weird, small, dummy-thick mice with the faces of children. I went into this film with no knowledge that these mice were a thing, and it scars you. It is just beyond weird. Weirder than the cats are. I'm not sure who made this decision. But I'm concerned for them. I'm concerned for whoever made this decision. I'm concerned for the people who were acting in it. It Because it, it, it's just like, how the hell did this happen? I know that the, the rest of the movie happened with the cats. But like, how did this happen? Like, it's like one nothing it almost. Yeah, that's all I can say. And that's just one of the big chaotic moments in this scene. Because that's just the first verse. Jenny Any Dots rests during the day. But when the day's hustle and bustle is done, then the Gumby Cat's work is but hardly begun. One thing she does is helping mice to be more productive. And in the second verse, she helps cockroaches to be more productive. And the cockroaches in this film are horrible. (laughs) Not horrible in terms of particularly disturbing or scary or insidious, but they're just designed and rendered horribly. 
they look like they've had completely human faces plunked onto various like cockroachy bodies but like a human in a cockroach morph suit do y'all remember elf yourself do y'all remember jibber jab videos in Elf Yourself where you could take the faces of your friends and of you and put them on like dancing elf bodies and you could all laugh about it as you and your friends dance to a song but it's you're not actually doing the dancing it's just on top of a video that was filmed by Elf Yourself. Like that. It is that standard of rendering. <laughs> this film had a budget of 80 to 100 million dollars and the cockroaches looked like nothing was put into them and there's hundreds of them. And they're tiny. And Rebel Wilson eats a couple of them. And it's just too fucking much. Because they don't look like cockroaches at all, really. They look like supermodels in bodysuits and bald caps. And the same three faces are printed on each one. They've got, like, wings, but that's it. They're shrunk down to a miniature size. <laughs> crawling up the leg of a table. <laughs> and it is chaos. Not even just chaotic. It's chaos. And once that's over, because thank fuck it ends, yeah, Jason Derulo comes in, and he's there to lead you from the madness, lead you from the weird thick mice children and the horrendously designed cockroaches, and into, what do you know, it's the next circle of hell. Oh no, you're not getting led to a land of peace and prosperity, no, 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 you're getting led, and I can't believe I have to say this, but you're being led to an orgy. Horny cats. All throughout this film, the cat's a horny. And it is really upsetting and unsettling. I was supposed to say unsettling there, but I said upsetting instead. But honestly, both of those words are appropriate. <laughs> that, honestly, all throughout the film, the cats are like this, but it really reaches its epoch when you get to the Rum Tum Tugger. And I don't even think it's the Rum Tum Tugger's fault. <laughs> like, specifically, it, I want to talk about the milk bar scene. <laughs> We need to talk about this. This is the scene where you realise that God died five years ago and he's not coming back. The way these cats lap at milk in the most sexually energised way, and they do it not just from a bowl or the top of a bottle, but from a dripping faucet. Because this had to be as frolic as possible. And if you think you're disturbed hearing me say that, imagine watching it in a cinema with people you have never met all around you. That's disturbing. And this was a U-rated movie! Kids were watching this! I, I, I don't know how. If, if the BBFC would like to explain uh, how this happened, I'd gladly be up for communication. Though this is a big scene where it meets its maximum horniness. It, there's always that little undercurrent, they're always a little like jazzed up, and it's not really a feeling you ever get comfortable with. But that's enough about the horniness, we'll not talk about that. Okay, weird body movements, let's talk about those instead. I am going to talk about the dancing but also the miscellaneous body movements, because I feel like it needs their own section. Because all of the actors went to cat school. If you didn't know, that was a big part of rehearsals and pre-production, question mark, was it like during the filming, the production side, or before filming, like the pre-production side? That I'm not sure, but it was essentially to get them in the mind and body and spirit of a jellical cat. From what I can tell, the creative team wanted very literal cats who happen to have human bodies and, and talk. They crawl off walls on all fours, they like to nuzzle, they meow in ways I, I really don't know how else to put that, it's really weird. At one point, Judy Dench lifts her leg up like she's a gymnast, all the while sitting in a basket dressed as a cat. I wish I were lying, partially because it sounds like I'm making it up, and if I made that up, I'd actually be pretty proud of myself. But no, I'm not making this up. This was shot on a camera and aired globally in cinemas. <laughs> so these cats are very literal, very visceral, very horny cats that are too human to animalize, but also too animalistic to seem fully human. It's it's a weird balance. I've seen videos from the musical and it feel, I feel like it pulls that off much better because they're in more obvious makeup, leg warmers, it's campier and it's Broadway and it works more. In the film, it's too literal to have the charm of the stage costumes, and it takes itself way too seriously to be camp, while doing all the same weird movements from which I've heard are more hammered into the film than the musical. Therefore, the movement's always just a slither too strange to get you fully comfortable, unless you're watching this film as a farce. Which, by the way, is a great lens to view this film is. Cats is a terrible serious musical, like, I mean, the film is. 
the musical is probably quite good, actually. But the film Cats, as a musical, is pretty bad. And it's pretty bad as a serious film. But as a farce, it's excellent. So maybe picture it in that light. All right, now we're going to go on to the dancing. There are some great dancing moments within the film. These dancers are pulling off some great routines. They're giving it their all. They're trying their best, despite the fact that the digital fare and the rotoscoping is really working against them. Again, allegedly there are heavy budget cuts to the FX team, so I'm not going to go against them because, as I said, it's not their fault. They're very much trying their hardest to make this salvageable. But I can't deny that there were choices made. <laughs> there were plenty of choices, particularly one long scene within the start of the Jellicle Ball, which is very dance heavy. And there are some good parts, but also some weird parts. The biggest one, we need to talk about the synchronized tail twitching, which, yes, I did just say, the tail twitching is probably the most chaotic dance moment in this film that doesn't involve mice or cockroaches or milk. However, there are also some unironically great dance moments. Skimbleshanks the Railway Cat is one of the most fun numbers in the film because of the dancing. And can we just all agree that Skimbleshanks was the MVP of this film? He killed it. And then Taylor Swift, I know I keep referring to her character as Taylor Swift rather than Bumble Arena, but they never use the name Bumble Arena in the film. And even now, I'm not 100% sure if I'm pronouncing that right, because they never tell us. But yes, Taylor Swift uses charisma in this scene, and I gladly listen to a whole campy Broadway album from her. I mean, I, I prefer that to acoustic, I guess. Now, midway through T Swizzle's Macavity number, Macavity himself comes in. He's already a slightly unnerving character with his glowing green cat eyes. It's a testament to the power of CGI in that they managed to make Idris Elba unattractive. But it gets even worse when they take his coat off. <laughs> Because under the coat is just a very unconvincing cat body that barely passes for a cat body. This is a guy in an all-in-one suit, like a morph suit, with some shiny fur attachments, like effects attached. You can see everything, while also seeing nothing. <laughs> it's weird and I hate it. It's not like the other cats where the fur plays with the light. It's like a, a naked Ken doll body and it's just weird. They really should have had another option or maybe like like dressed up in some like stripes or spots on the coat or just kept the damn coat on him like i don't know decisions were made with that character's design and they weren't good ones so after this old deuteronomy gets captured all the cats on the boat set themselves free and fight ray winston cat mr mustafa's magic's old deuteronomy back to the theater grizabella comes back into his memory she's a doubtful choice and she's sent up in the balloon that is just very straightforward nothing of note really happens in that bit then we move outside where the sun is rising and the cats are watching the balloon float to the heaviside layer. And then we get the lecture. <laughs> I'm going to call this a lecture because it feels a lot like one. Throughout the whole movie, there has never been a need to break the fourth wall because Victoria has been the audience surrogate. So all of our questions have kind of been her questions other than why did I pay to see this film? But now Victoria has been accepted as one of them. So old Deuteronomy turns to the audience to deliver her closing statement on how you, yes, you, listening to this very podcast, should talk to cats. It's weird. It's awkward. And it lasts five minutes. <laughs> you, you get as much Judy Dent to monologue into the camera as you get Taylor Swift in this whole film. I wish I was kidding. The main trio is in the background, Victoria, Mistopheles, and Monkey Strap, and they're still acting in the background. And you can just feel the awkwardness of them not knowing what they're supposed to be doing and just wondering that live as Judy Dent talks about how a cat may condescend. And she fucking lectures you. Like, she tells you straight up that a cat is not a dog. Like, she's telling you off smoking in the yard. It's really the moment where you realise all your years of hardship have led up to this moment where you get a multi-step instructional guide on what to feed a cat, led by a fairy Judy Dent in a massive coat and CGI ears but with plain hands in her own wedding ring. That's what you see when you die. I know, because I did. I died in that cinema. The old me is gone. I don't know that person. I only know the person that came out of the cinema at the end and shambled over to the cafe area with my sister, neither of us quite being the same as we were before. And that's Cats. Now, I realise there's a lot of stuff I haven't addressed in this episode, and honestly, a lot of the things I did address are things that happened to permeate most of the film. I didn't mention all of the songs or the characters or the oddities that take place. 
because it would just be a repeated recital of this thing happened and it was weird. This character is there and they looked weird. Like, I think there's this phenomenon within the film where you stop acknowledging the weirdness of what you're seeing unless it gets weirder. Like, if it's not one-upped, then it's practically business as usual. So, in my thoughts on this film, I really wanted to prioritise those moments of it gets worse, because they could have easily just shoved the most chaotic stuff at the start and got it over with. But instead, we get the creepy intro, the mice, the cockroaches, the horniness, the tail twitching, the cavity's weird body, and the seven up and Dame Judy Dench all spread out across the film. It's consistent chaos. So, we need to talk about the aftermath. Cats got a critical mauling and a 20% score on Rotten Tomatoes as the, the date of recording. That's the current statistics, unless it suddenly gets a boost, I don't know. And then recently, Andrew Lloyd Webber himself has even disowned the film in that novel. But around the time of the film's release, reviews proclaimed that it was a traumatising experience to the eye, which I can't argue with that, and at times even boring, which I kind of disagree with, but I do understand where that comes from. But it also got this sort of new fandom. Like, there were midnight screenings of this film just before COVID hit. There were packed crowds cheering and laughing at the sheer horror of the whole experience. It's almost like it's going to be the new Rocky Horror Picture Show or The Room, and that's awesome. But those were lower budget films. And I think it's actually kind of awesome that this high budget box office disaster is going to be the new cult classic because it's the ultimate example of director hubris, all star cast hubris, a film that people on the inside were probably really banking on to succeed and instead it just sank like a sad cat Titanic. And it's funny to laugh at that. It's funny to laugh at the nonsense decisions made during the production of this movie. The designs, the movements, the monumental failure of Tom Hooper's realism angle. It is hilarious. And the songs are fun. And you can sing along to them. And you can go to a screening. And take your friend who's never seen it. And you can watch your cat's virgin friend slowly lose the light in their eyes over the course of 110 minutes. That is priceless. And that, my friends, is why I like this film so much. <laughs> it is a fun, engaging, exciting, exceptionally bad car crash of a film, which will leave you bewildered, emboldened, and frankly, a little sexually confused. Yes, that question did pop up. And no, you are not allowed to judge me for that or my terrible grammar in that sentence. That is my job. <laughs> and I'm doing it very well. Self-critical as ever. <laughs> about six months ago, I filmed a video for my YouTube channel talking about my thoughts on cats, but... The footage sat on my old computer as I ruminated over whether I should post it or not. Then I realised I had some other ideas that should have been said in that footage but weren't, basically making the video pretty much obsolete. And then I got a new computer, so that video never got uploaded, and instead I decided that this would be the perfect way for me to talk about the most cursed film of 2019. And the perfect way to start my podcast. So, that was my first episode of this new podcast, me trying my best to talk about why I can't stop talking about cats. What's great about this podcast is that I can talk about something different every week, and I will be talking about something different every week, so if this episode was a bit mush for you, or a little bit off the wall, then you might just have a better experience with next week's episode. That's the fun thing about this podcast, it's all about taking a subject, no matter how off the wall it may seem, and getting into why I find it so fascinating, why it's taken up this mental capacity, even if it's just one little thing that I did at the end of last year. So, if cats isn't your thing, don't fret. Next week we'll be 100% free of horny cats. Just like the film, there will most likely not be a sequel to this episode. But if you did enjoy this and you do want to follow this podcast, you can quite literally click follow, or subscribe depending on your platform, so you can catch up with my attempts to talk about something every week. My current plan is for Saturday uploads, and any updates or changes will be posted on my Twitter or Instagram. Speaking of which, you can follow my Twitter and Instagram! The links are both in the description of this podcast. I also have my YouTube, which exists, so check that out if you're interested. I'll link that down too. All I have to say now is thank you so much for listening to this episode. And remember, life is hard, but all you can do is just try your best. See you next time.